Hello and welcome to my mini lecture on econometrics, which is given as part of the seminar Economic Analysis of Law and Public Choice. Um, before we start, um, yeah, just one fundamental question. Um, I have posted this in a forum, I just wanted to mention it quick in this video. I wanted to ask whether we actually need this lecture. Don't get me wrong, I will be recording, finishing recording the, today's lecture, but I'm not 100% sure whether we really need um, the whole lecture online. Um, well, for one, it's, uh, well, the lecture as a teach uh, as a teaching and learning technology is very old it's like one of the oldest there is um, and if you think about it uh, you will probably if you if you if you need to hear this lecture because you haven't had econometrics before then you probably have to read the literature anyway and what I'm telling you in this lecture is basically a short summary of the literature 99% uh, of what I talk about is taken from the literature. Um, yeah, so so I'm not sure whether we actually need this lecture. Um, the alternative would be to um, just have you read the literature and ask specific questions, and I can respond to those. Okay, maybe even specific questions. Um, with regard to your your individual topic, okay? Because each topic has different empirical methodology, and um, you could ask questions regarding that, okay? So um, I'm, I will be recording today's lecture, but before I well, if if there is any one person of you who insists on having the lecture, I'm going to continue doing it until I'm uh, finished. But please let me know. Okay, before I would like to resolve this before recording the second lecture next week. Okay, um, and of course, if we do not do the lecture, I could, um, I could still, get, I could still tell you specifically which pages are relevant. I can, well, you have all the slides, and I can also, well, give you exercises regarding specific topics, and so on, and so on. Having said that, let's start with econometrics. <clears throat> and let us first take a look at the literature that is required to read. Um, most of the introductory, most of the introductory part will be taken from this source, which is chapter two of the book, Modern Scientific Evidence, the Law and Science of Expert Testimony. Okay, so you can see uh, this is a source which is specifically um, written with ex uh, law experts in mind. Um, and as as soon as we uh, get into the the, the actual statistics and uh, regression analysis, I will be mostly referring to uh, these two sources. Um, well, actually, it's a huge book. Uh, the, the overall book is it's like a lexicon. It's called Reference Manual on Scientific Evidence. And what is that? It is um, a huge work, which uh, is kind of the standard source for uh, U.S. Um, judges. When they are confronted with um, empirical evidence in court, this is the book they refer to, uh, to read up on uh, topics. And specifically, you, um, I have uploaded for you the two chapters on statistics for the basics and multivariate regression. And that is, um, well, taken together, it's exactly 150 pages. But, um, of course, it's not all of it is strictly um, required to read. Okay, a lot of it is... Um, uh, repetition and a statistical appendix. So, well, y see this as you you should regard uh, these two sources as something you uh, where you can look up stuff. Okay. 
then um, maybe the most important source for you is Google um, everything I will be tell you, telling you in this lecture is very very standard okay so um, don't take my word for it don't take uh, the word of uh, these authors uh, for granted just Google stuff okay uh, most of the uh, the terms I'm using are very standard and just Google and uh, you will find a lot of lot of uh, sources and um, alternative explanations okay so if you have trouble understanding one something uh, in the literature you should do two things first um, well post pose your question your specific uh, uh, question in that in the discussion forum secondly Google it okay usually you will find an alternative explanation which you can better understand okay then some um, extra sources I've given you um, I have uploaded for you the uh, the book by Stefan Vogt uh, Institution Economic there uh, on pages 140 to 142 you'll have a well a really really short introduction in German into the concept of econometrics um, if you want you can read this up front because well just to it's just two pages and uh, if you have no idea what econometrics is maybe it's a nice idea to have this in the back of your mind okay Bef uh, before delving any deeper into the uh, other literature then I have uploaded um, a very short uh, script um, for you, which is called Quantitative Methods for Students of Law and Economics. This is, uh, has been produced by um, a former colleague of mine who teaches in the um, program European Master in Law and Economics in, at the University of Hamburg. And, well, this is a, also a very short introduction into what quantitative methods are, what econometrics is, how we can use statistics, and it's well, it's, it's written specifically for students of law and economics, so it should be suitable for you too. Okay, um, and also it's very short, um, so it might also be a good idea to read this up front. And then, um, well. You can refer to any uh, introductory uh, econometrics book. Um, some of the concepts you, you, you probably have to look up in econometrics uh, textbooks, which contain a lot of math and statistics, but the, some of the introductory ones are written really, really well. And this, the one I have cited here, is um, basically my favorite. Uh, it's by Jeffrey Wooldridge, and it's called Introductory Econometrics, A Modern Approach. Um, yeah, and compared to any other introductory textbooks, I would say this is the one that is written uh, best. Okay, um, and I have uploaded this one too for you, the the, the complete book. Um, yeah, just just uh, try reading in it. Uh, maybe the first two chapters. It's really nicely written. So this is basically. Um, well, this is basically all you need um, for this mini uh, crash course in econometrics, which um, admittedly is not, well, it is a lot, um, but well, it is, it's not an easy topic, and uh, but it's an important topic. You know? And anytime you are confronted with empirical literature, you should, um, you should have a firm basis in all these things. Okay, so my recommendation would be uh, to uh, start with these two things, so you yeah, kind of ha kind of have a basic understanding what all of this is about. This is the first part of my lecture. The second part of my lecture is based on these two things. Of course, not the whole book. And well, anytime you have trouble, look it up on Google Plus Post. A question in Moodle. Okay, let's start with the basics. What is econometrics? Um, 
you can uh, comp decompose the word and uh, you can see it contains the word economics and it contains the word metrics so um, literally it's about measuring um, something in, econometri in, in economics and but um, well actually what how we define econometrics is that uh, it's, about, it's about statistical testing of hypotheses generated by economic theories, okay? And what we usually refer to as empirical in the literature is this part, statistical testing, and theoretical is this part, economic theories. And you can already see, um, broadly speaking, we have three, uh, three, three ingredients to econometrics. First, we start out with economic theories. Based on that, we have hypotheses, and these hypotheses are tested using statistics. Okay, so we have one, two, three ingredients. Okay. What is scientific research? Um, well, I'm <coughs> Uh, in my law and economics courses, I like to begin the econometrics part, uh, the econometric, uh, econometrics lecture, with uh, um, well, some basics in what scientific research is, because um, oftentimes, um, be because law is a very different science, and uh, the approach of the social sciences is different, and so it might make sense to uh, give some basics in this. Okay. What is science all about? Basically, what we're trying to do in science is we're attempting to utilize logic in order to observe an empirical phenomenon such that valid conclusions can be drawn with respect to the phenomenon. Okay, um, this is a very abstract um, definition, but the important part is that it, even in this basic definition of science, which is encompasses empirical and theoretical um, research we already have the word empirical in there okay so uh, the important part is that the science is always always about something empirical something in, that we observe in reality um, <coughs> So, so this this definition of science is, is a standard in all of the social sciences and all of the um, in all of the how do you call it uh, life and natural science sciences. But it's not really standard in in law. Uh, oftentimes, there is a different approach to science and law, and um, um, well, it it's sometimes a hindrance. To um, to looking at a real world problems. Okay, so how does social science answer questions? Um, well, as you might as you might guess, we can never fully explain empirical uh, an empirical phenomenon just by theory. Okay. If we want to explain something that we observe in the real world, we uh, cannot do it by pure theory. Okay, we can try, but we never know whether the, it, um, our theory is uh, um, how how well our theory does. So, um, an empirical phenomenon um, requires empirical observation if we want to explain this phenomenon scientifically. And uh, what is what is empirical observation? What is a scientific observation? Um, usually just looking at a phenomenon is not enough scientifically as we will see in this uh, following example um, imagine you are trying to find out the number of teeth um, that a horse has so um, okay first off can we explain this phenomenon just by theory? Um, no, of course not. 
uh, we can try but we don't know whether um, how good our theory is so um, we ha actually have to find some horses and look into their mouths and um, okay but but how exactly do we uh, go about it okay so do we just find the next best horse and count their teeth um, no that's not enough okay um, because just some random horse that we find um, well, it could be missing teeth um, the number of teeth could be dependent on the age of the horse on the sex on the race a lot of factors could play a role um, so the scientist would uh, start uh, drawing systematic samples um, systematic samples and then create <coughs> and then calculate um, average numbers uh, average numbers um, cons uh, controlling for uh, several s several relevant characteristics okay and the important part here is that you would draw a sample and not um, because you cannot you cannot uh, observe all horses in this world uh, but more on that in a minute um, the important part is I have just described to you one way of observing an, a phenomenon and well uh, another way of um, naming this is methodology okay a way of observing some empirical phenomenon is a methodology and there are different empirical methodologies and um, different empirical methodologies can lead to different results which is why we have to be very clear about this and empirical methodology basically is about how how our research design is in order to observe something empirically now um, a, an important distinction that we have to do is um, between empirical and normative questions some of you might know the difference an empirical question uh, is regards is regarding something um, how it is okay uh, so descriptive is a synonym for this and another synonym is positive okay um, so basically <coughs> With empirical questions, we ask, "How is it? How many teeth does a horse have?" Okay. Um, a normative question is, "How many teeth should a horse have?" Okay. So we're trying to um, pose a question: How something should be? Okay. So, and, and for the most part, in science, in social science, we try to dis, um, we try to separate these two kinds of questions because. Um, because well, normative questions all, ha, uh, always um, have a more subjective component to them, because um, well, because implicitly we have we have decided what something is uh, what what is good and what is bad. Okay, and that is well kind of subjective, and usually in economics. In, in, in my brand of economics we try to stick to empirical questions to descriptive questions okay um, well if you look at um, labor mar labor market policy an empirical a, a descriptive a positive question would be um, if we introduce um, this this and this measure how does this change um, the unemployment rate Okay, so this is a purely empirical question uh, based on describing what happens. A normative question would be what, how, how large should the unemployment rate be in an economy? Or um, the employment rate should be 0%, something like that. That's a normative statement. Okay? Um, and that presupposes that we, that we think a zero percent unemployment rate is best okay
Okay, if we uh, look at the literature, one way of um, describing the standard process of scientific research is the following. First off, we observe a phenomenon which interests us, something that um, catches our eye. And secondly, we um, try to formulate theories uh, that are with, with and with those uh, theories we try to explain this phenomenon and based on those theories based on this theory uh, we can formulate hypothesis based on the theory um, and well in our context these hypotheses will be something like predictions okay if I change this and this factor what happens with this other factor and the this prediction is based on the theory so the theory is somewhat more encompassing and the hypothesis is just a specific prediction regarding some variable okay uh, in case you were wondering what the difference between the hypothesis and the theory is and then the fourth step is probably the largest the largest um, we develop a study a scientific study to test the hypothesis that we uh, formulated in uh, step number three um, and um, well we develop a study we um, we receive some kind of data and we uh, do some statistical analysis and with these results in step five we can either reject our theory we can modify our theory or we can generate a new one okay everything is possible um, and when we're done with um, that we can start over okay uh, step six is really 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 important because um, well scientific research is a process okay so um, it never ends with steps step five okay you can never um, finally reject a theory or, um, or or confirm a theory um, and if you modify a theory well the logic step is to start new with um, at the beginning or if you generate a new one also you have to be, uh, start over at the beginning and as such uh, the scientific research is always an ongoing process okay um, that's really important Nothing's really set in stone. Now you might have noticed that um, I try to avoid saying that uh, we uh, prove we can prove theories. Okay, um, that is very important because, of course, uh, in a pure theoretical sense, we can prove theories. Okay, um, we can uh, do a mathematical proof of a theory, but that's not what I have in mind here. What I have in mind here is um, when we have a, an, an hypo a hypothesis uh, generated from some theory, we can only falsify it, we can only reject it, we can never prove it, okay? At least in my understanding of science, because um, think about it. Does it make sense trying to prove some hypothesis? Um, consider the, the most famous example, uh, the black swan. Okay. Uh, imagine we have a theory that all swans are white. Okay. Can we prove this theory somehow empirically by uh, looking at all swans? Um, no, of course not. We, even if we were able to observe all the swans that are existent in this world, what about the swans that are, have already died? What about the swans that have not been born yet? We can never um, um, ultimately prove a hypothesis like this. Okay, but we can reject this hypothesis. How? As soon as we um, observe one black swan. We can falsify this theory okay we can reject the hypothesis that all swans are white as soon as we have one black swan 
and that is why basically um, in empirical social sciences we always try to falsify hypotheses and instead of verifying them and um, thinking back to the process of scientific research it makes sense okay uh, if if we were somehow able to verify some theory the process of scientific research would be over because well it's proven and it's done okay but we can all only reject it so we have some hypothesis we just develop a study um, let's say we we, uh, we are not able to reject the theory so uh, the, the preliminary result would be um, that using this study um, the hypothesis cannot be rejected but someone else might develop a different study on the same topic and they might find that is uh, it can be rejected with their approach and so on and so on so science is always about a, an ongoing process and a discussion um, on why different methods might yield different results and well, you can imagine the longer some theory um, cannot be rejected by uh, empirical studies the the stronger it is regarded to be and the the more robust we can say it is okay L let us now look at different uh, methods with which we can do empirical research um, coming from natural sciences this is probably the, the the most standard way of doing it we can do research in a laboratory okay the advantage of doing uh, empirical research in a laboratory is of course uh, we can um, almost to a hundred percent we can um, exclude we can exclude uh, factors that are irrelevant because we have a, a controlled laboratory uh, setting so um, we can uh, fully control what happens and uh, what 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 factors are given in this uh, laboratory experiment and of course um, the disadvantage of laboratory uh, research is that because we exclude so many uh, factors um, the setting of the experiment is often not realistic and yields different results uh, than in reality okay because oftentimes we do not know beforehand what factors are relevant and what uh, which factors are not so how how, how how can we know how to exclude um, how to uh, which factors to exclude okay and another problem of course for us is that in in social sciences uh, it is oftentimes hard to realize a laboratory experiment okay because most social science uh, questions cannot be answered using experiments with um, lab rats okay we need actual people because it's about society so uh, do, but conducting uh, laboratory experiments with actual people is of course really hard um, because how do you how do you uh, create how do you construct a social situation an economic situation a lawn economic situation in the lab huh? um, it's not easy but there is some well there is uh, some researchers who try to do it okay um, yeah there there are ways of doing it and usually it is realized via a, a computer lab okay uh, you have some instructions on the screen you uh, have some kind of payoff and people play randomly against each other which is a v well which is one way of approximating for some social science social situation but it's not perfect of course um okay a second way of doing it would be field research um we have said that lab laboratory methods are oftentimes uh, artificial because we exclude a lot of factors and to tackle these problems we could um, we could be conducting field research okay which means that we uh, try to observe the phenomenon 
that we are interested in in its natural setting. Okay, that means that our re research uh, results are more generalizable because um, we can be sure that um, we haven't left out any relevant factor. But of course, we have the uh, opposite problem. We might have too many irrelevant uh, external factors that um, drive the results. Okay, so, and we cannot be sure because if, if we do field research, we cannot we cannot control perfectly um, the setting of our um, observation. Another way f uh, to do research is simulations. Um, in economics, uh, uh, simulations are used. Um, we can, based on our theory, we have some uh, predictions regarding behavior of uh, people, and um, we can run simulations in order to see whether these, whether some result, whether some dynamic result holds when we uh, repeat some social situation. Think of okay, that's very abstract, but uh, just think of. Um, Think of SimCity, the, the computer game, or any uh, any similar game. Um, well, basically, uh, that's a simulation, right? It, the word simulation is in 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 the the, the computer game's name. Uh, you have in in a game like SimCity, you you are somewhat like God, but you don't you don't um, you don't control each individual in your city. You just um, you just uh, give the basic setting, okay, and see what happens, and that basically is what a simulation is about, okay. And finally, we can conduct survey research, um, where basically we interview people live or by uh, sending them a questionnaire, and based on their responses, uh, we can uh, draw inferences regarding um, values, norms. And opinions okay um, well the advantage of this kind of research is that we can easily um, easily easily um, collect information on uh, on on certain phenomena for example if you want if you are interested in the phenomenon of drinking and driving um, of course it's much easier to ask someone on the phone whether they have ever uh, done drinking and driving um, then knocking on their doorstep and asking them okay or um, conducting some experiment on the topic uh, on s uh, well that's one advantage is that on concerning certain critical topics it's easier to, to conduct a survey than any other form but of course the problem is um, social acceptance right if you even if you uh, do an anonymous interview by telephone people you can never be uh, sure that people answer truthfully okay some people might exaggerate in order to appear uh, somewhat uh, cool or um, daredevil some people might uh, um, lie in the opposite direction and say they have never done it because they, well they're embarrassed to admit it even in an anonymous setting okay so in this setting um, a lot of work has to go into how the questions are formulated and uh, to avoid some of those problems I've mentioned this list is not it's not a, this is not a complete list of research methods it's um, but it includes some of the most common methods for empirical research. Um, now, before we can uh, really get going, we have to um, consider the concept of conceptual versus uh, operational definitions. Because well, before we conduct a study, before we design a study, we have to know what we what is it that we are interested in and how do we uh, measure these okay um, let's say we have 
Okay, we are we have done step one. We have found some empirical phenomenon that we are interested to do scientific research on. And um, now we have to determine what is it exactly that we are interested in. Okay, we have to formulate what it is. And there, uh, so when we define what we are interested in, we have to distinguish between a conceptual and, a, and an operational definition. A conceptual definition is a very abstract way of describing a phenomenon and an operational definition um, is more concrete uh, and it's more concrete and more specific um, on how we might be able to measure this phenomenon okay and why is it important to do, to distinguish these two things well um, on any on any uh, given topic, you might have several different studies, okay, several different empirical studies, and uh, all of these studies might be about the same phenomenon, so they might have in common one conceptual definition of a problem, but because they use different operational definitions, um, the results of those uh, different studies might still not be comparable, even if they are on the same phenomenon and they are sharing a conceptual definition they might still not be comparable because they use different operational definitions okay then when we have decided upon a conceptual and an operational definition we have to be more specific on how we want to measure something okay and here we have this is very classic, you can read on this uh, on Wikipedia. We have four different scales of measuring things and, um, well, what we are able to 